Welcome to Star Talk Radio. My name is David Grinspoon. I'm an astrobiologist and a planetary scientist. And I'm here with my co host, Chuck Nice. Hey. Dave, how are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Chuck? Great, man. So uh, I'm happy to see you. Uh, I am sitting in for Neil Tyson, and we're left here to carry on without him as best we can. And so we will be today doing cosmic queries. Yes. Answering your questions. And uh, what's what's the topic today? Okay, so today, of course, we uh, call all of our resources and uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and uh, all of the various outlets where we appear on the Internet. And uh, today, we have questions about human impact on our very own planet Earth. Oh, is yeah. Earth something... is a planet. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, it's part of space. And so it, it belongs in Star Talk, right? It certainly does, you know. And, you know, there's a lot of things in space that have a a big effect on Earth, you know? And uh, so what we have done is we've got all these questions here. You have not seen them. I've not seen the questions. And uh, I understand that even though you are an astrobiologist, that this is also something that you are a, a subject expert, would that be? Well, it's something I've been studying a lot recently. I mean, as a planetary scientist, I've always been interested in Earth. That's a lot of what we learn when we study planetary science is how to think about planets. So you learn about volcanism, earthquakes, right. you know, all the things that make Earth tick. The, the, the climate and so forth, but we, we usually apply them to other planets. But what I've been doing recently is saying, well, let's take the techniques of planetary science and, and think about Earth as a planet, and even think about, about humanity and the human impact as, a, as an event on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are humans doing to the planet, and how, if, if we're thinking as planetary scientists, how would that look, how the way humans are changing the planet? So that is what I've been working on recently, and I think it's definitely a topic for space science. Sure. How, how does that space perspective influence the way we look back at our own planet, and what can we learn about our planet from that space perspective? I'm going to say that what we can learn is that we as human beings suck when it comes... I got a feeling Earth looks at us like we suck. I'm just sorry. That's pretty much how well, we've got a lot to answer for. I mean, we've really been, we've become a major geological force on this planet. And some of what we're doing is a little bit more, like you compare us to things in the past and you look at the asteroid that came and wiped out 90% of the species. And right now we're that asteroid, you know, <laughs> we're, uh, you know, we're causing a mass extinction. We're changing the climate in radical ways. And we're not, it's not like we planned to do this. Nobody said, hey, this is a good idea. We're just sort of stumbling into this role. Right. So now a lot of people are saying, well, let's look at this role and figure out, you know, what do we want to be on this planet? So I think we're, we're in this moment of realization of what our role is. Let's hope. I think you're a bit more optimistic than perhaps I am. I'm a bit more of a cynic, but let's see what our, uh, let's see what our listeners have to say in the Absolutely. form of the questions that they have for you. Our first one is from Kaylin uh, Bugby. What a great name. From Huntsville, Alabama. We're talking about human impacts on Earth in one of my classes. We have been debating which human activity will lead to the collapse of society as we know it. We have discussed energy consumption, overpopulation, destruction by technology vis-a-vis -vis robots, destruction by nuclear terrorism, pandemics, and finally water pollution. If you could pick one destructive human force, which one would it be? B, what a happy question! Wow, we got quite, quite the menu there. Yes. Well, um, thank you, thank you for that question. I mean, it's it's a good question, and I, I would have to say your question does presuppose a certain pessimism, like which one is going to destroy us? It doesn't leave us the option that maybe none of them will. Nonetheless, uh, the first thing I would say is those are all conflated because it's 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 what we call a wicked problem where where you can't really separate things out. Population is ultimately related to all those things. Correct. If we weren't, you know, pushing uh, 9 billion people uh, come mid-century, mm -hmm. then almost none of those other pro problems of the human footprint would be... Would, have a, would be really significant. ...as big a deal. Right. But I think... Not you know, to mention travel, because she says, like, pandemics, which, absolutely. honestly, that... That wouldn't happen if we weren't traveling all around to and fro the way we do. Yeah, I mean, those are all related problems. I, I, I would say, you know, out of all of those, the most immediate one is you got to go to climate change because that is one that we know is happening now. It's accelerating, and we don't have a clear path to solve it. We have some good ideas.
ideas and a lot of good intentions, and I don't see that as hopeless. But out of all those other ones, like, you know, robots taking over, maybe, you know, that could be scary in the future. Right now, it's not the thing that keeps me up at night. So we don't have to fear Cyberdyne systems quite yet, huh? Not quite yet. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's smart to be aware that our world will change rapidly as computers get smarter, and some of those changes might not be completely to our liking. It's, right. You know, it's good to have that on our radar. But, but let's face it, climate change is happening right now. We don't all agree completely about the extent of it, but uh, most scientifically literate people now recognize that it is happening and that there is a large degree of implication of humans and that if we're not going to be the stupid species that soils its nest right. and dies, um, or at least destroys its civilization, right. then we ought to really be applying our intellect to dealing with that now. Well, there you go, Kaylin. There's your answer. One, don't poop where you eat. And two, um, we're looking forward to terroristic, nuclear terroristic robots that cause climate change. That is the <laughs> biggest fear that we should have. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay, climate change, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's move on. Um, so the next one from Tommy Maines uh, from St. Charles, Missouri. I'm reading Kevin Kelly's What Technology Wants. One hypothesis in the book is that technology was inevitable from the point of the Big Bang. Do you find this to be true? If so, can we now harness technology to heal our environment? So uh, did the Big Bang create technology? And how do we heal our environment? Well, the laws of nature were set in motion with the Big Bang, and those laws seem to be conducive to the evolution of life on some planets. Mm -hmm. And I think on some of those planets that complex life will lead to technology. Technology. So in a certain sense, technology was ordained by the Big Bang, not exactly on this planet. So kind exactly of roundabout, in a roundabout way. Yeah, the capacity for technology. And yes, I think technology can be used to heal the problems we have. Not technology alone. A lot of it's going to come through self-knowledge and us being able to manage ourselves more wisely. But that knowledge of self has to go hand in hand with knowledge of nature and knowledge of how to manipulate nature, which is technology. So technology, yes, it was ordained in the Big Bang. And yes, Yes, it will be part of the solution. Yes, our savior, technology. <laughs> Thank you, Big Bang. <laughs> so um, let's see, what do, we, what do we got for another question? We got some more questions coming your way. Let me just uh, reiterate that uh, you have not seen these questions. You're just answering them uh, as if uh, the person were here, as if we were all the annoying guy at the bar, you know? I've met that guy before. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God, you're an astrobiologist. Okay, how do I power the planet with poop? <laughs> All right, you got to buy me a drink first, and then maybe we'll get to that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, this is from Saba Nagi from Budapest. Do you agree with George Carlin that we exist because Earth wanted plastic but didn't know how to make it? It's a pretty funny joke, actually. Uh, just imagine looking at the Earth with a microscope and seeing all this mold, us humans, growing, living, spreading as a byproduct, making plastic. Clearly, she despises humanity. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but no, so it's, now it's the real a, question here. Question, yeah. Yeah, the real question here is because she's she's making a joke. But here's the real question here: um, Would we be considered a kind of a virus? A bit of a scourge on the on the face of the earth. And the second, I'm going to make an addendum to her question coming from me personally. Do we belong here? Because it kind of seems like we don't. It seems like the only people that aren't in sync with what's going on on earth is us. So are we? A virus? And well, do we belong here? Those are great questions. Thank you, Saba. And, um... Uh, you and, know, and Chuck, I'm going to, yeah. And thank you, Chuck. <laughs> I, I want to stand up for the human race here a little bit though. Okay. I mean, it's like, sure. It's obvious in some ways we're like a virus. So you look at the pattern of our growth and you look at a virus and, you know, in an organism and the, it, it just reproduces to the point where it makes its host ill or kills its host. But of course, a successful virus doesn't kill off its host. Mm, right. True. And a successful species may get to a certain point of over reproduction and then have some self-preservation instinct and decide not to kill off its host. And, you know, if you look at the long history of life on Earth, we're not the first species to come along and sort of screw up the planet. There have been catastrophes that have 
come along before that have been caused by species of life. The cyanobacteria 2.2 billion years ago uh, evolved photosynthesis and they thought, oh, here's a great energy source, sunlight. This is wonderful. And they started polluting the air with oxygen, which caused a catastrophe and wiped out most of the species that were alive then. So interestingly, we're not the first species to come along in the quest for an energy source and screw up the planet. Uh, that's not to get us completely off the hook because we do have supposedly intelligence and foresight and consciousness. But it's right. to say, okay, uh, this, you know, life interacts with the planet in complex ways, and we're, it's our turn right now, and we're interacting with the planet in this way that so far has been this sort of exponential growth and this exponential perturbation. And yeah, if we don't change some of our patterns, then we will be like that virus and just destroy our own civilization, and that would be too bad. But we're having this conversation. We're becoming aware of our role on the Earth. And so I actually think that that makes us different from the cyanobacteria, and maybe we'll get to the point where um, we have enough of that conversation and we can start to actually sort of self-consciously alter our role. That's my wish, and actually that's my expectation. I think we're, we've got a lot of learning to do, but we are a species that uh, alters our world and learns and changes our behavior. And I, I'm actually optimistic about the human experience on Earth. And I can see why people think we are like a virus. We have been like a virus. But most viruses don't talk about the fact that they're like viruses. And, True. And we do. We're talking. And so We're maybe, a self-aware virus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it makes us a little different. A little different. So there you go. There's your answer. Uh, human beings, a little bit better than the cyanobacteria. So... <laughs> That's slightly great. better. Slightly. Just slightly We're better. We're a little bit better than slime. That's it. Just a little <laughs> bit better than slime. Smart slime. Yeah, that's our new motto. <laughs> <laughs> we're slime, but we're smart. There you go. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, Rob Wilkinson. And Rob is from Jacksonville, Florida. With pollution problems such as the Pacific Garbage Patch, how viable is using the magma of subduction zones to break down garbage, especially plastic, to reduce the number of landfills? This guy's thought about this question just a a little bit. Uh, what's what's what his theory? Does it wow? Does it hold water? <laughs> That's that's pretty that's pretty wild. I mean, first of all, yeah, Pacific Garbage Patch. There's a big zone of garbage of, yes. of plastic right. that uh, has been found in the Pacific. It's kind of scary because it's this huge zone, that, you know, hundreds of miles across. That's that's all of our stuff that's sort of collecting there in the Pacific and slowly breaking down. So it's it's you know it's big. The human impact on Earth is not subtle any longer. Now, specifically, this notion of using the magma in subduction zones for those of the that don't know a subduction zone is a place where uh, you know Earth has plate tectonics. The plates, uh, the, the crust, the solid part of our Earth is split into these uh, thirteen or so plates that are sliding around and crashing into each other, and some of them are crumping up, crumpling up into mountains, and other ones are getting pushed underneath. And the places where they get pushed underneath, deep into the Earth, are subduction zones, and that is a place where material gets taken down into the Earth and broken down into its constituents you know, elements or at least small molecules. And so if you could take all the plastic and put it in the right place, yeah, that would get rid of it uh, for sure and break it down. I don't know how feasible it is. I'd like to, like the Beatles said, I'd like to see your plan, you know, but, um, but I'd I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, that's the kind of creative thinking that we need. You know, how do you really get rid of plastic? Sure, put it on a sub in a subduction zone and send it to the mantle of the earth. I'm all for it. If I could see the details, uh, I wouldn't wouldn't rule it out. I've, I would, I would, you know, before I invested in this, I need to see a, right. see a little more, a uh, little more of the, uh, the but, but details. But in theory, he's got a pretty decent plan there. So yeah, I mean, there's nothing that there's nothing that sounds wacky about it to me. It sounds, um, you know, like and maybe 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 there is a well developed plan for this that I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Give our trash to the Morlocks. It's their problem now. Really? There really? you go. They might even like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here uh, let's move on to Yusef Vet Mark Esparza. What a great name, huh? Wow. Regarding these recent earthquakes in Texas, are there real? Are they really attributed? 
to natural gas fracking. Should we stop the fracking and find another way to get natural gas? Let me just uh, say, in addition to that, it is no longer just Texas. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and several other places in the country where we have seen seismic activity where we otherwise have not, and there is also fracking. Of course, the people who frack say there's no connection. No, no, there is a connection. It's pretty, it's pretty well known, and it's, it's understood physically how it works. Uh, when you pump large amounts of water underground, you loosen up some of those faults, mm -hmm. and they move, and you get earthquakes. Fortunately, the earthquakes you get from this tend to be shallow and rather small. Mm -hmm. And there's even the argument that that's good because they're relieving tension on the faults, which otherwise would build up and eventually result in a larger earthquake. So, so there have been fracking related earthquakes. There haven't been like massive catastrophic ones. Uh, it does speak to the fact that there are unintended consequences when we start doing these major engineering projects and like altering the earth in intense ways in our greater and greater effort to extract those last bits of fossil fuels from the earth. And, you know, there are different opinions about fracking. It's, uh, it's giving us fuel at a time that we need to re reduce our foreign dependence on oil. It's making America and, great. Well, and natural gas is better than coal, but on the long, in the long run, it's only at best an interim solution because we got to move our energy supply away from fossil fuels. I mean, we have to, whether we're worried about climate change or not, because they're going to run out. And if we go to extreme lengths to get those last little few percent remains of fossil fuels, we could do a lot of damage, you know, the tar sands and tabletop my, uh, um, mountaintop mining. There's a lot of like really horrible things you could do to get that last bit of fossil fuels. Right. Maybe fracking goes into that, maybe not. I think there's ways to do it safer and there's a lot of danger to the water supply and so forth. So I have mixed feelings about fracking, but the earthquakes are real and they do speak to the fact that we're not smart enough to anticipate all the unintended consequences and ultimately we know we got to go beyond fossil fuels. So we really ought to be putting our creativity and our ingenuity into those new energy supplies that we're going to need no matter how much fracking we do. Hmm. So uh, the answer is, without a doubt, these earthquakes are real. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, we pretty much need to stop fracking. Uh, yeah, in the long run. In, in the, the long, long run. run. Absolutely. Okay. And um, you do realize that's never going to happen. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. It's <laughs> a lot of money we're talking about Well, here. eventually it's got to happen because we're going to run out of all that stuff. Uh, you know what? Now, that's the day I'm looking forward to. <laughs> you know, the day we get off of fossil fuels is the day where there are no more fossil fuels. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of well, sad. That's, that's one way to look at it. But one way or another, you know, a thousand years from now, probably a hundred years from now, we're not going to be using fossil fuels. There you go. All right, well, let's take a break, and we'll come back in a little bit, and we'll have some more Star Talk. Because there's only so much oil in the ground. Sooner later there won't be none around. Alternate sources of power must be found. Because there's only so much oil. Hey, when it comes to magazines, you know what you like. And with Texture, you can get all the magazines you want in one super convenient place. The Texture app lets you tap into the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere, any place using your smartphone or your tablet. Breeze through hundreds of your favorite magazines, including back issues, and pick the articles that interest you the most. Texture has made it easy to find articles you care about. I just don't read popular mechanics. The Texture editorial team recommends content for me every day. Plus, I can dive deeper with personalized collections. I also love the extras like video that I can get when I'm viewing my magazine on my tablet or my phone. So here's the best part. Texture is offering Star Talk listeners a free trial right now when you go to texture.com slash Star Talk. You'll gain immediate entry to all the top magazines, including back issues and bonus video content. Start binge reading for free right now when you go to Texture.com slash Star Talk. That's Texture.com slash Star Talk. I've been using Texture for about a year now. Take it from me personally. You will not be sorry. Bringing space and science down to earth. You're listening to Star Talk. Welcome back to 
Star Talk Radio. I'm David Grinspoon. I'm guest hosting, sitting in for Neil Tyson, and I'm here with uh, with Chuck Nice, That's right. co-host. And um, let's uh, let's do a little uh, self promotion here. Chuck, what's what's your uh, Twitter handle yeah. for the folks? Why, thank you, David. That was so kind of you. Uh, you can find me at Chuck Nice Comic on Twitter. So if you uh, like to follow me, I'm more than happy to have you. That's so interesting. You know, I've got a Twitter handle too. And what would that be? That would be Dr. Funky Spoon, at Dr. Funky Spoon. That is awesome. Yeah. Dr. Funky Spoon. I love it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and, um, and, and my website is funkyscience.net. Funkyscience.net. And the Star Talk website is startalkradio.net. That's correct. So you can find all kinds of more cool stuff at that address. Anyways, let's get back to um, doom and destruction. <laughs> and it seems like we've been on this on this riff of you know the whole everything about the human impact on Earth isn't like negative and destruction and and terror and and doomsday. But it seems like that's what people associate with the topic. And, that's true. Um, yeah, it's understandable why. It's, it so. is only because uh, you know you really don't see uh, lemurs screwing up the environment so that's you know we gotta we gotta we gotta own that given enough time the lemurs would evolve to the point where you know they would <laughs> be causing horrible industrial damage too i'm sure daggone those lemurs <laughs> eight million years from now you just watch what they do to the planet exactly you love your lemurs so much all right here we go let's go to um let's go to libby powell crow who said uh the solution to pollution is dilution is it that's basically what she wants to know is the solution to pollution <laughs> dilution well, i just want to say that all over the solution to pollution is, is dilution. dilution i think he's got it that's okay. good that's good yeah well it, it, it's a great question and it's catchy too uh you know it, it, and superficially yes i mean you know, everybody's, um, let's face it, taken a leak in the ocean at some point in their life. And y you don't think like, too badly about that because the ocean is huge, right? And it's like, what's the problem? But oh, but hopefully you don't do it in a hot tub, right? Because that's like little and but ultimately of course the world is more like that hot tub and um you know on any given scale i mean the hot question these days is uh fukushima radiation and that's like a whole you know hot button question but the fact is you can put a lot of radiation in the ocean at one point and by the time you're talking about the whole ocean if you look at the numbers and you get to the other side of that ocean then you're down in the noise you're down in in you know the natural variation level where you really don't have to worry about it so in a certain it's not harmful exactly so yeah the solution to pollution is dilution but you can't use that as a cop-out and figure because the ocean isn't infinite right and one thing we've learned i think historically people thought the world was infinite and you know the west you know we could just keep expanding forever but hey you get to the end at some point and you come back and you encounter yourself and so ultimately no the solution to pollution is, is not, not dilution, dilution. It's, it's a short-term fix for an awful, horrible problem yeah, exactly. that you should probably look to something else other than the uh, dilution. Yes. All right. yeah, so but, it I, is, but it is catchy. But it is catchy. I do like it. Yeah. And you know what I've learned from this question? Why no one wants to get in my hot tub. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's pretty much what I figured That's out. right. Hey, I'm not saying I do that. I was just using an example. No, I'm saying I do. And that's the problem. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this is from Drew Willis from Davidson, North Carolina. What impact did the Industrial Revolution in America slash Europe have on the current climate now? There are pictures of smokestacks and children and soot, etc. Are we now developing industrial aspects of Asia going through the same thing now? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, when did this problem really start? Right. It was in the 80s that people first started really talking about global warming as this might be, you know, something we really need to pay attention to. Some people warned about it 100 years ago, but, you know, it wasn't considered a mainstream worry. But now people are looking at what we call the Anthropocene era, which is this study of the human impact on Earth, looking at it as a geological period, you know, the, the time at which humans are, are right. changing the Earth. And, and it's an interesting question. When did that start? 
Some people say it was the Industrial Revolution. That's when, you know, we discovered the steam engine. We started using right. a lot of fossil fuels. That's when we started pumping CO2 into the air. Right. Some people th say it started even before then, by In the way, way with agriculture. Did, yeah, I was going to say it kind of starts with agriculture with a lot of cow farts. Let's be honest. You got a lot of cow, cow farts. Cow farts and clearing the land. Clearing the land. Deforestation. Which, which deforestation. Yep, changing uh, the, the, the carbon cycle. Humans really started changing the carbon cycle and changing the climate thousands of years ago. Right. So it accelerated in the Industrial Revolution of the, you know, 1850, and it's really accelerated in the last 30 years with what we call the Great Acceleration, where everything's right. going exponentially off the charts. So, also, is is it also too because now we're all doing it? You know, it, you know, before it was just Europe and America. That's now right. it's Europe, America, China, Russia, uh, the all of brick. Uh, you know, it's it's like everybody's Yeah, going. the developing nations now, one of the ways in which they're developing is they're mimicking our, you know, success in really <laughs> messing up the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, who are we to say they shouldn't do it? Because we did it, but and we're all, all gonna, in this together. So all they're going to say back is, I learned it from watching you. Exactly. But hopefully, you know, it's in our interest to help them do their technology better. It's in everyone's interest. So, yeah, you know, in a certain sense, they've got the right to pollute because we've polluted. But in another sense, we've all got to solve this problem because we all, there's only one atmosphere and we're all breathing it. Cool. Now, very quickly, what was that era you, you said again? The, the Anthropocene era. Anthropo human. Right, human. The yeah. Anthropocene era. Just remember that, uh, Drew, because there's the answer to your question. It's all of us at all times. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we'll be back in a few minutes with more Star Talk. <laughs> Unlocking the secrets of your world and everything orbiting around it. This is Star Talk. Star Talk. Hey, global warming. Global warming. We're looking for love. Respect. Respect. Stand up and be counted. Don't ever let them cut us down. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. I'm astrobiologist David Grinspoon, sitting in for Neil Tyson, and I'm here with Chuck Nice. Yes, yes. And we're talking about, we're doing cosmic queries, talking about human impact on Earth. And Chuck has all these great questions sent in by listeners, and uh, let's, let's, let's have another one. Let's jump right back into it, okay? And this one from Marco Horvat. Now, Marco says, do you think the climate change debate would be different if global warming was branded as climate change from the beginning? Well, that's a tough question. I, you know, it's like a, so much not a science question. It's a, it's a marketing and psychology question. I mean, it's very interesting. And I think at those of us in the science community, we kind of get down on ourselves and say, oh, we've handled this wrong. There's all this anti-science and people are confused and against, if only we had used this word and not that word. And I don't know. I think the resistance comes from the fact that... That um, there's a great deal of money being thrown at the problem well, by energy companies the, who want to confuse the issue, maybe? Yeah, money exploiting human psychology. And the human psychology is to not be able to believe that we are actually affecting the Earth in this way. I mean, after all, it's the Earth and we're just us, right? And right. like, how could we possibly be messing up the entire world? And so uh, there's, a, there's a natural human disbelief in this, and that's been exploited, I think, by those who do have an interest financially mm -hmm. in saying, oh, you know, global warming, haha. -ha. And then, of course, we respond to these short time scale things. So there'll be right. like a cold spell or a snowstorm and people will say, oh, there, where's your global warming? Right. You know, and right. of course it doesn't work that way. In fact, you can have years of cold temperatures and global warming is still happening because there's natural fluctuations superimposed on the long term trend. But, you know, you, it, it, is, it is a marketing problem at getting people to accept to this. Accept and so, so you can wonder, okay, what if we hadn't used global warming? You know, did we make some horrible mistake? I tend to think no. No, it's like it's more a question of getting people to kind of grow up and face reality, and and that it's not oh, like good luck with that. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> but I don't think we made some horrible language choice by calling it global warming. Right. Yeah, maybe climate change is better in a certain sense in that it's more complex than just, oh, things are getting hotter. It's all these changes, rainfall, storms, uh, you know, right. uh, moisture, temperature, so all now, these connected changes. I heard somebody say once we should call it global weirding because really it's more about extreme weather patterns, not just climate or 
as as you say, temperature or not weather, but yeah. extremeness of the weather. Absolutely, absolutely, global weirding because because there are certain locations, of course, that will get warmer in certain locations that won't as much for a long time and certain right. places will be winners and losers and there'll be changes in precipitation patterns it's much more complex than just a change in temperature so global weirding is not bad of course it doesn't roll off the tongue yeah it kind of makes earth seem creepy right yeah just like you know hey what are you, what are you wearing you know that yeah global weirding that's maybe not the best or getting weird well you know what here's a follow-up uh to marco's question from daniel heed or head i'm gonna go with heed are climate changes really climate changes? Okay. Are we look like we call it climate change? Is it really climate change? Well, what else would it be? I mean, okay. Now, I, I think climate, he means like on a permanent basis. Ah, uh, uh, like permanent. Is yeah. it permanent change? Is it like a oh. permanent change? Well, it's not just no. crazy weather patterns. It's not. It's not permanent what we're doing because the Earth has these long-term cycles where, in fact, the carbon is regulated without our interference at all. Long before we got here, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere went up, it went down, and, uh, you know, due to all kinds of complexities in the Earth system and changes in the orbit and solar radiation and positions of the continents, there's all these things that over the long term change climate. And Earth has a natural mechanism that regulates CO2 and regulates climate. In the long run, because of volcanoes and because of chemical reactions that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and make limestone and all that, the, the Earth returns to normal and the climate will return to normal. But that takes a few million years to happen. <laughs> so that will not help us. Oh, there you the go. The Earth will return to normal without us, so nothing's permanent. But on the time scale that we worry about, on our time scale of our civilization, it's what we're doing will last for thousands, tens of thousands of years. So for your purposes and my purposes, it's pretty permanent. Gotcha. So here you go. Catastrophic for us, nothing to the Earth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We're not threatening the Earth. People say, save the Earth. No, no, no. It's not save the Earth. The Earth will be fine. It's save the humans. Right. So basically, when you talk about these debates, it's about our own carcasses. Well, and all the other species CYA. that were taken with us. You know, I you really know? don't care about them, David. <laughs> I, I got to well, tell you the you truth. Well, you should, because we need them. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm a, I'm a little partial to human beings, because yeah, but, I happen to be one. But try to be a human being on Earth without those other species, and we're hosed. And we are now ready, hopefully, for the lightning round. This is where we quickly get to a lot of the questions we didn't get to before and give succinct but highly incisive and accurate answers. That is correct, sir. And whenever you are done with your answer to alert me that it's time to move on. I'm going to do this. And there we have it. So oh, that let's, felt good. That doesn't that feel good? Yeah. All right. Let's jump right into it. All right. This is from uh, uh, Susan Minobi. Uh, to combat global warming, besides reducing our production of greenhouse gases, is there any way to reduce the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth? I'm thinking ring world shadow squares around the Earth rather than around the sun. Oh, yeah, there are schemes that people have come up with where we could block some solar radiation by putting things in orbit, big shadowy squares, uh, massive engineering schemes. In the long run, humanity might want to do something like that. I'm wary of that in the short run because that's sort of an abdication of our responsibility to just, like, get control out of our energy and our emissions. But I think we should put that in the parking lot, as they say, and consider it for some future time when we know what we're doing a little bit more with space technology and we may ultimately need to because the sun's getting warmer and in the future we're going to have to take more drastic measures so yeah maybe maybe ultimately we'll do that let's go for another one Ooh, yeah there you go all right this is from mark wright on twitter is nuclear power maybe our best real choice morally chernobyl place territory beyond human use but plants and animals thrive hmm the morality of nuclear power is a lightning question. Sure, that's easy. Uh, you know, it's a tricky question. The more concerned you are about global warming as an emergency, the more you have to consider other power sources. And nuclear power does not create the kind of carbon footprint that fossil fuels does. Nuclear power is scary because it makes all this waste that lasts for a long time and we don't completely know how to deal with. But I think the responsible thing for us to do is to be seriously considering nuclear as part of the constellation of of solutions that we need to come up with, but it's not going to be the whole answer, and it's probably not something that should be completely off limits. There you go. 
Also from Twitter, Rachel Fender says, what would the consequences of a sudden decrease in greenhouse gases be versus a gradual decrease? Ah, uh, good question. Very because good. everybody's worried about climate change, more and more CO2 yeah. getting hotter. What would happen if the CO2 went away? Right away, today. Which, by the way, when you talk about some of these solutions, like let's geoengineer something, let's design some organism that sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. What if we're too successful and we can't turn it off and all the CO2 goes away? We would die. We depend on the fact that we have a couple hundred parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere to keep Earth warm enough. Right. So a sudden decrease in CO2 would be just as bad or worse, maybe even than a sudden increase in CO2. Mm -hmm. You need a certain range of CO2 and you don't want to go too far out of that range in either direction. Awesome answer. I love it. Uh, yeah, but would it help if we just all hyperventilated? <laughs> you know. It may help you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, this is from Ben Ratner, also from Twitter. What have we learned about life in space that we have been able to use to improve life on Earth? Well, I mean, in an overall sense, the perspective of thinking about life in space and how life works on planets in general has given us a lot of new perspective on life on our planet. But more specifically, we've learned about things about how radiation affects organisms. We've learned how to think about closed environments. If you're going to design a space station, you need to recycle everything. Well, ultimately, we're realizing now that our own Earth is a closed environment. We talk about Biosphere 2. Right. Well, we're here in Biosphere 1. Biosphere right. 1 is a closed environment. And so just the thinking about how you would design space systems, I think, really has made us smarter about realizing that in a certain sense, we are in a, in a space system. We are life in space. Our planet is spaceship Earth. And so some of those design problems turn back around and help us conceive of how we're going to survive for the long term on this spaceship that we happen to have evolved on. Awesome. Great answer. All right. Uh, this one is from Beth Grace. The risk we are taking with our planet reflects certain mindsets we have about natural resources and our relationships with other life. What lessons do you think we need to learn before we colonize other planets in order to avoid transporting the same patterns of mismanagement to other worlds? It's a really good question because people tend to have this utopian view of, oh, we'll just go colonize other planets and everything will be fine. But, of course, we're going to bring our same mindsets and, and patterns there. And ultimately, do we want to just turn Mars into a giant strip mall and, you know, strip mined um, disaster zone? And uh, no, of course, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of humans going into space and exploring and living elsewhere. But... But we can't escape ourselves, and ultimately the lessons of how to live sustainably on a planet are ones that we're going to have to learn and carry with us wherever we go in the universe. So there it is. Get it right at home first, then take it on the road. seems like more and more people are cooking gourmet meals. They're putting them on Pinterest and Instagram, and they're bragging, look at what I made. And you know you're a little jealous because you don't know how to do that. Well, guess what? Blue Apron's got you covered. They're going to let you know how to do that. And you know that eating at home means eating healthier and saving money instead of ordering expensive takeout again and again. And you start this all with Blue Apron for less than $10 per meal. Blue Apron delivers all the fresh ingredients you need to create home-cooked meals. All you do is follow the easy step-by-step -step instructions. Each meal can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. No overwhelming trips to the grocery store. No more sad, pathetic takeout. And no matter what your dietary preference, Blue Apron makes it a breeze to discover and prepare dishes like crispy fish tacos and chipotle cabbage slaw with fresh avocado and radish. Oh, yeah. How about soy glazed meatballs with marinated radish, Swiss char, and jasmine rice? Ooh, oh, yeah, you know you want it. 
and cook with ingredients you've never used before, like watermelon radishes, farro, purple potatoes. Sound good? Well, here's what will make it sound even better. All the recipes are between five and 700 calories per portion. They're delicious and they're good for you. So here's what you do. Right now, you can get your first two meals for free at blueapron.com slash star talk. You heard me for free at blueapron.com slash star talk. That's blueapron.com slash star talk. Come on, baby. Let's get cooking. Bringing space and science down to earth. You're listening to Star Talk. Star Talk. You've been listening to one of our classic episodes originally recorded for season five of the podcast. I'm Dr. Funky Spoon, astrobiologist David Grinspoon, and now I'm back. I'm calling into the studio from my home to give you a little bit more. And I'm with my co-host, Chuck Nice. Chuck, thanks for joining us for this. Of course, Dr. Funky Spoon. How have you been, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Doing well. What's happening? Anything good going on? Anything new and exciting in the life of Dr. Funky Spoon? Oh, uh, you know, just doing what I do, uh, going around the solar system and, uh, and uh, solving uh, problems for people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've just emerged from the process of finishing up my book, Earth in Human Hands, which yeah. is going to drop later this year. Nice. Very so, nice. Uh, that and trying to just, uh, you know, stay alive. And I know your book is about, uh, you know, it, it's almost self-explanatory in the title, but Earth in Human Hands, it's uh, how we affect this planet and our behavior, what it does to the planet long term. And, and what is your prognosis right now? I'm taking a planetary science view of the problem, which means uh, looking over billions of years and trying to see our current moment in that deep timescape. Right. And... I actually, I think that gives me a little bit more of a uh, of sympathy for us than than uh, maybe some other people express in the sense that, um, you know, there's really something very unusual happening on Earth now. Go ahead. There's never before been a geological force aware of its own existence. Um, so we're actually trying to do something really hard. That's Here we are. We're finding ourselves altering this planet and realizing. We have to we have to sort of manage this planet, but we don't know how to manage a planet. You know, we don't have a manual, and uh, we're sort of almost surprised to find ourselves here. It's almost it's like waking up in the middle of driving a big rig down a road, and you have to say, "Whoa, I, I better figure out how to drive this thing in a hurry." That's our situation on Earth. So that, that, um, I, I, it's I gotta, easy to get down on ourselves, David. I, I got to tell you, I, I just have to tell you. That is one of the scariest situations that you could describe. <laughs> Waking up in the middle of driving a big rig, 16 gears and all, that's, that's horrifying. What are you talking about? That's, yeah, but, that's scary as hell. <laughs> yeah, but, but the thing is we've done similar things before in, in the sense that human beings, if there's one thing that makes differentiates us, differentiates us as a species, we're problem solvers and we're, we're inventors. And we've gotten out of some tight jams in the past. If you take an evolutionary look at, at us, there have been times in the past when the human species almost went extinct. There was a time 190,000 years ago when we were in Africa and there was, a, there was climate change and ice age and, and human, human species almost got wiped out. And we survived by inventing new technologies and inventing uh, new ways of, of cooperating and working together and, and, and solving problems. So you're, uh, and I think that's what we do. So you're saying and, and, that and so the, we're the finding ourselves in this challenging the, situation. The innovations that we are capable of may be the answer to our survival. So the fact that we were able to survive the Ice Age now, let me just ask you, since you bought up the Ice Age, um, 
When you look at climate change, now, you know, uh, you know we, we've seen all the pictures, of course, in elementary school of the Ice Age and human beings being a part of the Ice Age and, you know, us, uh, wearing our pelts and our, you know, fur skins and all that kind of stuff. Of course, we found fire. There were different things that we did that, that were able to make shelter became part of what we did. Um, now, when you look at that, the difference is we're never going to have another ice age, if I'm correct. Uh, we're going in the opposite direction. What, what can we do to survive that? Because now you're looking at drought. You're looking at food shortages. You're looking at ge geographic changes in the topography of the earth because there are some places that are going to disappear because of the rise of sea levels. So, you know, what are some of the things that we're going to be able to do to survive that? Well, first of all, let me clear up a possible misconception because you talk about the Ice Age like it was one thing. In reality, if you look at the history of Earth, our, the Earth's climate, it's gone from Ice Age to Hot House to Ice Age to Hot House. And the last 10,000 years have been kind of unusual in that our climate's been pretty stable and pretty warm. And we've been lucky. We've flourished in this uh, artificial, well, not artificially, but the unusually stable, warm climate period. And so uh, the challenge, the immediate challenge we have right now, as you say, is to uh, deal with this warming and sea level change and drought and all these things that are happening as a result of our uh, our emissions of fossil fuels. But, you know, that's temporary. One way or another, that's temporary. Uh, it can't go on very long. The bigger, longer picture is that the Earth does go through climate fluctuations and will, yes, go through another ice age in another 50 or 100,000 years or so. Left to its own devices, natural climate change would do us in eventually. But I don't actually think there's going to be any natural climate change anymore. And I think in the long run, that's a good thing. Once we get over our immediate problem of sort of stumbling into this climate change that we're forcing, we'll learn a more thoughtful way to interact with the planet's climate. And in the long run, that will mean we'll prevent the next ice age and we'll prevent other disasters from happening. So the flip side of having to get a handle on our own behavior right now is that we're coming to understand the way the planet's climate changes so much so, better, and that's going to save our butts in so, the long run. So what, you're, what I hear you saying, because now, now listen, I know you... I know you, Dr. Funky Spoon. I know that you, my friend, are a uh, eternal optimist. You are always looking at the best case scenario. It sounds to me like you're saying that the problems that we have presented ourselves, uh, we've created these problems, but these problems may be the impetus for much greater success and sustainability of the human race going forward. We're going to be forced to deal with something that may end up helping us much further down the line. And am, 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 I, am I right to hear you say, is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, in fact, in my book, uh, Earth and Human Hands, I call this the twisted gift of global warming. There's a, it, it's obviously a tragedy in the short run. In the long run, it's a gift because we have no choice but to learn how to be planetary operators. Uh, if it's not climate change, it's other technology we're developing. We, we can't put the genie back in the bottle and not have planet changing technology. So we have to get good at it. And global warming is forcing us, forcing that reckoning. And in the long run, that's going to empower us not just to save ourselves, but to save other life. Even though we're right now causing this mass extinction or possibly causing a mass extinction, I think in the long run, humanity can prevent a lot more extinction than it will cause. There's not going to be another asteroid impact, and there's not going to be another ice age. Those things killed a lot more species, ultimately, than we're threatening now. So I'm not trying to get us off the hook. We have to, as quickly as we can, change our current behavior. But I do think in the long run, we can also see potential for us to learn how to actually be the kind of constructive players on the earth that we should be and actually conserve and protect life once we get over our current problem of this sort of flagrant uh, emissions that we, we have to curtail. So I, what you're saying kind of like, because <clears throat> I, I don't want people 
What I don't want is for somebody who's a climate denier to hear this and say, see, it doesn't make a difference anyway because it's a, better, it's a good thing for us. Exxon is helping us, okay? Don't you understand? Exxon is saving us without even knowing it. But what you're saying is in, in the vein of necessity is the mother of invention, once we're presented with these problems, we're going to have to come up with a solution. And so the inspiration for uh, solution building will be there, but... That notwithstanding, we still have to make sure that we take care of this problem. And one of the ways that we are going to have to take care of this problem is to get off of our dependency on fossil fuel and move towards sustainable renewable energies that uh, do not uh, cause uh, uh, sea ri the, level the rise in sea levels and, and global warming. Yeah, exactly. Basically, we have to grow up. <laughs> and, uh, I love you know, you know we've we've been able to get away with the earth is pretty big and we've you know until recently haven't completely taken it over and so we've been able to get away with uh throwing stuff away as if there wasn't a way but there is no a way right we realize that it's finite and uh part of maturity is realizing the limits and learning how to work within those limits this is a time when the human species has to has to gain that maturity to really see clearly the situation we're in. And global warming is the problem that is forcing us to really understand the, the nature of ourselves as a, uh, a species on a planet that is uh, altering that planet. And that if we want to uh, survive and we want to be, uh, you know, good, good sort of citizens of this planet, we have to uh, take a new look and, and reassess and reintegrate ourselves in a healthy way into the functioning of that planet. We no longer have the luxury to not be a part of the way the planet functions. As, as shocking as that seems, mm -hmm. our cognitive systems, our technology are now, I think, permanent parts of the way the earth operates you know unless we blow it which we could but there's also a possible future where we learn how to do that well and we integrate gracefully into the functioning of the planet and that's uh that's what i'm trying to push here and that's by the way i have a name for that state, right. and i call it terra sapiens terra sapiens earth. yes i i think terra sapiens is what we have to try to achieve we are homo sapiens right. supposedly wise apes and we need to now recognize ourselves as a planetary species and build terra sapiens so that's, on that's, earth guided by wisdom that's that's the equivalent of us growing up that's so that's what a grown-up homo sapien is when you grow up you become a terra sapien I yes like and, and your planet that's also a name for the planet, because right. the point is we're becoming one with the planet. We're becoming integrated into it. So Terra Sapiens is what we have to become, and it's also what the kind of planet we have to build. And, and we have to realize that the boundaries between what we consider natural and artificial are uh, sort of shockingly uh, no longer there. It's all one Awesome, man. I wish we had more time for this. That's Well, one thing I'm taking away from this is Terra Sapien. I want to be a Terra Sapien. I'm already a Terra Sapien. I don't know about anybody else. I'm already a Terra Sapien because I'm, I'm sold in. I'm sold you in. Know, Sitting there floating in front of that galaxy, uh, Chuck, you look like a Terra Sapien to me. That's right. I'm representing all Terra Sapiens. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is great, man. Great talking to you again. I wish we had more time, but it looks like we're done on this one, man. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you. This has been Star Talk. And I'm astrobiologist David Grinspoon with my co-host Chuck Nice. And thank you very much for listening.